Okay, um, welcome to the APKM API Deep Dive. Uh, my name's Adam Radford. I'm a Distinguished Systems Engineer at Cisco. i um, been focused around network programmability for the last couple of years. Um, my background is actually software, so I spent the first uh, 10 years of my career writing software for a living, most of it around network management and automation. Um, and the idea behind that was so I could spend uh, less time at work and more time doing triathlon, which is something that I was quite passionate about at the time. So anyone who's uh, a triathlete, come chat to me later. Anyone who's interested in Hawaii Ironman and that sort of stuff, crazy stuff, come talk to me. Um, we're going to cover a few things today. A little bit about just the overall of the, uh, view of the controller. Going to cover some of the topology, uh, inventory APIs. Going to also talk about plug and play, um, which is a, a way of getting devices onto the network. Um, possibly touch a little bit, depending on how we, much time we have, on intelligent WAN. And then a little bit around easy quads and dynamic quads. So those are some of the things that we're going to, to cover. This is not a networking session, so it's not about network protocols. It's about network concepts and how you can explore them using a controller that we've been working on for the last couple of years. Uh, a couple of links. Um, if you do a search for me, for my name, um, and blogs, there's a whole range of, actually do it in quotes, Adam Radford. Um, blog. There's a whole bunch of blogs that I've been putting together around various um, programmability topics. So the one in November is actually an index, and it's got a whole range of different topics around plug and play, um, APKM APIs for engineers, NetConf Yang, um, a little bit about 1.3, which just came out a couple of uh, about a month ago. And I'll be adding um, more blogs to this series over the next week. I've set myself a little challenge this week. I'm going to try and produce five blogs in five days for Cisco Live Europe, um, one day down. So the, uh, I've finished off the um, part five one for APIs. I've got another four to go before I go home. Um, the other thing I would encourage you to do, if you go to communities.cisco.com and if you look at DevNet, or developer DevNet, and then under that, uh, networking APKM. If you've got questions around how APIs work, how the controller works, I um, encourage you to use this forum. People are pretty responsive. Um, you'll get a, a pretty quick answer if, if people can help you. Um, it's just a good place to, to get started. OK, um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we get going. Who thinks this is an ACI data center presentation? Excellent. Excellent. I've been doing this for three years. And each year, the number of hands that go up has got less and less. So I think we're at zero now, which is, which is really, really good. So we're talking about the controller that we've been working on for the campus and WAN. It's going to work on routers, switches, and wireless uh, LAN controllers. If you look at what we're trying to do, um, we're trying to simplify the way that networks are deployed and simplify the way that networks are changed. Um, I think it's no secret that routing, switching, wireless networks have been quite difficult to deploy. And once they have been deployed, what do you do? Don't touch them, right? If it ain't broke, you don't fix it. So this is all about changing that. And the idea of using a controller is that a controller can essentially treat the network as a system, provide a level of abstraction that allows you to interact with the controller via the API or the user interface and uh, get good things to happen on the network. Platform architecture, APKM is uh, a modern piece of software. It's microservices based. Those services communicate east-west through a message bus. All of those services ex expose APIs. The nice thing about that is that everything that you see me do on the controller I can do programmatically via an API. How many people are familiar with APIC? They've downloaded it, used it in their labs? Yep. Cool. How much does it cost? It's free. Um, some of the applications like IWAN are licensed, but um, the general controller is no charge. Who's familiar with a REST API? Who's not? OK, I'll just do a two minute two-second REST um, overview. So an API is the way you interact with a, another application, application programming interface. REST is probably the most common. 
And the reason for that is how many people can use a web browser? Okay. If you can use a web browser, you can use the REST API. Um, if you think about what happens when you go to, you open your web browser and you type in www.cisco.com, it's essentially going to cisco.com, it's getting access to the slash directory or index.html, and it's going to get or download that. And REST really has these three concepts. It has this notion of a verb, which is an action that you're performing. When I open my browser, it's going to do a get, and it has a resource that it's going to perform that action on, which is you know, slash or index.html. And then it has some sort of formatting or syntax that is used for uh, structuring the data. Because anyone ever had issues with autocorrect, spell check? Machines don't necessarily understand what we really mean. Um, and they like data to be structured in a certain way. So things like XML and JSON or JavaScript object notation are really a way of making sure that data is structured in a way that removes ambiguity. So if you think about that analogy, um, if I wanted to create an account on Cisco.com, I would have to give some information. I would format or structure that. If it was JSON, it would be key, comma, value. So um, username would be my email address, um, password, colon, my password. I would structure that information. I would post it to the controller, sorry, the, the web server. It would then perform the appropriate action, create the account, et cetera, and I get a response back. So that's a, a primitive analogy in terms of how REST works. There are really four things that you can do. Anyone done database theory, CRUD? Yep, so they map to the four things, create, update, read, um, delete. Get is how you um, access information or read information. Post is how you create something new. Put is how you um, modify something that exists already. And delete is, uh, is fairly obvious. Um, in terms of APKEM, uh, all of the resources that the controller has are exposed. Um, and we typically term these as nouns. These are things that you perform an action on. So if I wanted to find out all of the network devices on the controller, I would look at slash network device. And what would I do? Put, post. I want to find out all the network devices on the controller. A get, right? I would do a get of slash network device, and that would give me a list of all of the network devices that were defined on that controller. Similarly, if I wanted to find out all of the um, host or user devices, all of the Macs, all of the notebooks, the laptops that are connected to the uh, controller, or connected to the network, I should say, uh, I would do a get of slash host. And that would return all of that information. Now, the way that JSON works is it's actually fairly simple. Curly braces denote structure. And then it's key, colon, value. And they need to be in double quotes. Um, anyone using smart quotes in Microsoft is going to have problems with this. So the first thing you do whenever you're going to do a presentation um, is turn off smart quotes. Because what will happen is Microsoft PowerPoint and Word will turn those double quotes into smart quotes. And when you paste those into um, a, uh, a payload, bad things happen. So you get all of these. And everyone's done it, right? You'll get all of these uh, syntax errors because of the smart quotes. Um, you can also have uh, a key colon structure. So in this case, there's a structure that is associated with network user. Um, I've got a user identifier is actually a list. So this could be multiple items with a comma separating them. And it could also be a list of structures as well. So on this one example, you probably see just about all of the permutations in terms of how JSON works and how you can structure data. Who finds that easy to read? It's not too bad, right? Um, I think it's a little bit easier than XML. That's just a personal preference. Um, but the point is that machines find this incredibly easy to read because it's very well structured. And that's really the point about JSON um, syntax. Um, one of the things that the DevNet team has done is they have put a, a an APIC controller in the cloud that is publicly available. So if you go to sandboxapic.cisco.com, and if you use these credentials, you'll get access to a fully fledged, fully working um, APIC controller, or what appears to be. Um, now, the reality is, and just between us in the room, and there's not very many people here, 
Um, it's actually only a database, so there are no real network devices underneath, but that's actually okay because for most 99% of the, the API calls that you want to make, um, you actually don't need to have physical devices under the covers. There are obviously some exceptions, but for a lot of the learning um, examples that we have, it actually works really well on this database-only controller. One of the cool things about um, the controller is that, can everyone read that at the back? Do I need to make it slightly bigger? 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 Is that okay? Cool. Um, one of the nice things about the controller, this is the home page of the controller. You've got a list of applications down the left-hand side. You've got things like um, discovery, which is how you um, basically discover the network. That creates a, a database of all the network devices. I know lots of different things about those network devices. I know the version of code they're running. I know the serial number, MAC address. I even got the whole config. Um, I've got the same thing for all of the hosts that are connected to the network. I can then render that information in topology and get a view of, of how the network fits together. So those applications are, are fairly simple. One of the cool things about the way that APIC works is that if I click on that little API button, essentially what I get is through Swagger, which is a tool that the developers use to document their APIs, I get a list of all of the APIs that the controller has. If I scroll down to inventory, and if I click on network device, you'll see here is the example that I gave earlier. So get slash network device. If I click on that, it'll give me some information about how the uh, API call um, works. And the really cool thing is, if you click on try it out, guess what happens? It actually executes the call. So this is a great way of understanding the APIs because it actually executes this API call on the controller with real data, and it gives me real data back. So you can see here that the JSON um, response that's come back has got uh, a list of all of the network devices, and you can see all of the attributes that I have for those network devices. Is that big enough up the back? One more? OK. Now, one thing that you need to know here. If I scroll down to the bottom of this particular device, which is a, what is it? It's a 2960, and it's running 15.2. Whoa, some funky version of code. Um, it's got this thing called an ID. Any ideas what that is? It's a 32 character string. What is that? Uh, close. It's actually a universally unique identifier. And the reason that we use that is that every resource that gets created will have one of these universally unique identifiers. What does that mean? Let's say I identified a device by uh, management IP address. Uh, so in this case, it's 165.10.1.39. So that's how I was going to um, store my devices in, on the controller. <coughs> what would happen if that management IP address changed? What would I do? Cause a problem, right? So the way that we manage that is that every resource that gets created will have this 32 character string associated with it, which is a resource ID. It's guaranteed to be unique. I think the chances of getting two of them are the same as winning the, the US lottery five times in a row. So almost infinitesimal, but nothing's ever certain. Um, how many people remember that string? So if I was to scroll down here, anyone remember that? Any photographic memories here? A uh, little tip for you. Even though it's 32 characters, I normally just worry about the last four. So C9, C7 is the last four characters of that UUID. So if I was troubleshooting, looking at debugs or logs of things that were, were happening, what was it? C9, C7. Much easier to remember than the 32 character string. OK. Um, 
One of the other things that I have done is I've put together a Postman collection. Who's heard of Postman? Yep, who's used Postman? Who likes Postman? I love Postman and I'll tell you why in a sec. Um, one of the things I've done is I've put to collection, uh, together a collection on Postman. Um, it's available on a, a repo on um, DevNet. So if you go to github.com and if you just search for my user ID, which is A Radford, you'll see here there's a repository called um, APKM Samples A Radford. And there's a whole bunch of stuff in here, tools, um, which is where the Postman um, stuff is, the Postman collection, a whole bunch of other things. Anyway, one thing you can do is you can import that Postman collection, and it will give you a collection of API requests and also an environment to run them against. Now, when I used the Swagger tool, did I need to authenticate? When I used Swagger, did I authenticate? Well, you didn't see me authenticate, but I had authenticated to get into the UI to begin with. So I already had an authentication token because I was using the user interface. So when I clicked on the API button, it was actually going to use my existing credentials. So the API calls were authenticated. It was just using a token that I had generated earlier. If you were to make a REST API call on the controller without using the UI, you need to authenticate and you need to have a token to use to make that or to send with that uh, API request. The way you get that token is you call an API called API slash V1 slash ticket, not terribly imaginative. Um, and that payload is really quite simple. It's username and password. Now, here's one of the reasons that I like um, Postman. It has this notion of environment variables. So anything in a double curly brace is actually a variable. So the username and the password are actually variables that come from this environment up here. That means that all I need to do is to press send and it's going to use the username and password that I had saved or I have provided you to make that request. Now, when I hit send here, you notice that what I get back is what's called a service ticket. So again, this is one of these funky looking large random strings of um, letters and numbers. And I'm going to need to collect that because every API call I make, I need to put uh, a header with this particular token in it. I need to put a header with this particular token in it. Now, I don't like cutting and pasting. The reason that I like Postman is that Postman allows me to embed some magic JavaScript in the background to actually capture this service ticket and store it in a variable. So if you look at the, um, the last four um, characters of this um, token, you'll see that it's IVHN. It always ends in CAS, by the way, Common Authentication Server. Now, if I come up here and look at the environment variables, you'll notice that there's an environment variable called token that actually has exactly the same um, IVHN CAS. And what's happened is every time I make that request, if I press send again, and you can see here the next one is IGNS, just to show you that it's not smoke and mirrors, that variable gets dynamically updated. Now what that means is that once I authenticate, I can run any of these other API calls just by hitting send. So I can get a list of network devices, and I can do that very easily just by hitting the send button. Um, I can get a list of um, hosts on the network. You can run through all of these APIs, and it'll basically I've got a whole bunch of worked examples in terms of how all of these APIs work. So that's um, a collection of. Um, of REST API calls that I have. And I think it makes it quite easy to, um, to look through and see what's going on. Um, one other point I wanted to make around the host piece. If I look at this host, and I'll actually look at the next one because that's the one I want to. So this host is 
10.2.1.22. It has this particular MAC address. It's a wired device. What do you reckon these IDs are? I've got a connected network device ID, and I've got a connected interface ID. Switch. So it is actually the switch and the interface on the switch that this device is connected to. Now, the reason that that's important is that let's say this host was having a problem, and I wanted to find out what version of code the switch was running. How would I do that? Well, I'll give you a hint. The network connected network ID, device ID is a way that I could find out information about that particular network device. So if I was to copy and paste that, and if I was to make a request that said, instead of connected network device 1 slash 14, if I was to say connected network device slash that 32 character string, and if I was to press send, that would just give me all of the information about that particular device. Remember, if I said just slash network device, it would give me everything. If I said slash network device slash 1 slash 100, it would give me the first 100. If I say slash network device slash 32 character universally unique identifier, it gives me just that record back. And that's a, a common sort of semantic that the, the controller has across everything that it does. So that's a pretty simple example of how you can then cross-reference. So I could find out information about the interface. Actually, let's do that. So if I go back to that host, and if I look at the interface, which happens to be, and I, I get a little hint here in that it's gigabit 1 slash 0 slash 47. If I have a look here at the interface, You see here, I've got all of the information about the interface. So I can see it's a switch port. I can see it's up, it's physical. I can see the speed, the MAC address, IF index, the admin status, the port name, what it's connected to, the duplex, um, the native VLAN, all of the information about that particular interface. So that's just a very simple example around how all of these um, API calls can, can integrate together. The next thing I wanted to cover off is, oh, we didn't do any slides. Is that OK? I reckon uh, a 10-minute demo is worth about 1,000 PowerPoint slides. So we've done about 20 minutes of demo. So we've probably done about you know, 2,000 slides by now. We've covered all of this. I reckon you, you need to see it rather than it's pretty boring if you just go through. Actually, let me just cut the path trace. So one of the, um, the cool basic apps on the controller is something called path trace. And here's one I prepared earlier. And essentially what this does is you give it a source and a destination IP address. And you can optionally give it source and destination ports. You can optionally give it UDP, TCP. Uh, you can optionally give it um, collect statistics and do an ACL trace. And essentially what it does is it works out how this particular device talks to that particular device and the path through the network. So it shows you, um, in this particular case, it's a host that is the source. It doesn't have to be. It could be a network interface. Uh, it shows you that it's um, connected to a, an access point. It shows the CAPWAP tunnel from that access point back to a wireless LAN controller. And it shows you all of the intermediate devices along the way. And then it shows you the switch network. And if I scroll along here, you'll see that it's, um, it's gone out over the WAN. It's gone out over to a branch router. And essentially, it's connected to a wired host out in a branch somewhere. Now, all of this is available through an API call. So if I go back to my collection, um, there's a, a collection called path trace. And what I need to do there is I need to do a post because I need to create a, a job that's going to um, do that path trace. So if you look at the body of that job, the, the minimum I need is a source and a destination IP. If I press send, who's, uh, who's got familiarity with the REST API and response codes? 
Yep, what do you expect I should get back? I'm doing a post. Should start with a 2. Should probably a 201, right? Which means created. Let's see what happens. Press send. And what do I get as a response code? I get a 202 accepted. Why is that? And I don't get my task, I don't get my um, information back, I get a task ID. Now this is another um, pattern in terms of how the controller works. Essentially what happens is the controller is operating in an asynchronous mode. Whenever you do a, a post, which does a creation, a put, which does a modification or a delete that removes something, that will be an asynchronous operation. Now, I also operate asynchronously. On a Saturday morning, my wife will tell me that there are five things that need doing. Now, the reason that I operate asynchronously is I say, yes, 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 and then I will execute those things over the next two days or so. Now, if I was to operate synchronously, what I would do is I would say, when I, the first task came in, which was mow the lawn, I would not say anything to her until I'd completed that task, which doesn't go down too well, right? So if, if there was a synchronous call, then you have to wait or block until that call operation completes before you can move on to the next one. So for, in terms of creating a scalable architecture, normally they're asynchronous, which means you accept the result. There's a job that runs in the background. When that job is finished, you get the result as a, as a, as a part of that task. So the thing that's important here is the task ID. That's the thing you need to, to monitor. And again, the reason I love Postman is that if I look up here, that task ID is nine, uh, 4393. And that's actually stored in an environment variable called task ID, so 4393, which means that I can just do a get of task slash task ID. And that's going to tell me um, or give me the response. Now this three things that are important here. End time means that the task is completed. If there's no end time, then it means that it's still running. Is error? Is false? Is a good thing? It means that there were no problems. And the final thing is progress is another one of these 32 character universe unique identifiers. And that's the resource or the, the place that I can go to get the response. So again, that's been saved away in the, some magic in the, the background. And if I was to do a get, of API v0, v1 flow analysis slash path ID, what you'll see is the, the JSON response for um, that request. So you can see the, the request that I made. You can see the last update time. And then you can see a list of network elements info that comes back. Anyone remember what the host was? It was a, it was a wireless host. It connected to an access point that was 10.1.14.3. So if I look at this, you can see there's the host 10.1.14.3. It essentially mirrors exactly what you see in the API. Oh, sorry, in the UI. OK. How many people are interested in plug and play, network plug and play? OK. So I might just spend a little bit of time on this. Um, Plug and play is a way of getting uh, a device out of the box onto the network and give it a configuration and an image file. It's a pretty simple concept. Um, APKM has a plug and play service. That service works completely by API. And today there are five things that use that API. Um, the APKM GUI, um, the IWAN app in APKM uses the plug and play service to provision a new branch site out of the box. We have a mobile app um, for an installer that also uses those APIs. Um, Prime Infrastructure uses those APIs because the Prime plug and play service is going away. And there's something called ESA that we'll hear about in a little bit later that also uses those APIs. So essentially, the way that this works is if I go to controller, I have a library of images and configurations. So a configuration is just a, a text file that has the uh, database only controller, right? So yeah, OK. That's all good. Has um, a library of text files that are really just um, configurations. It has a library of images. 
um, that you can upload uh, optionally. And then there are two ways that the controller can do plug and play. If you know about the device in advance, you can create a rule in a project. And that means that the, the, whenever that serial number connects to the controller, it will match the rule. And whatever is in the rule in terms of the configuration file and the image file will be pushed down to that device. If a device that is not in a project, if there's no rule, then it goes into the unclaimed bucket. And then I can go in and manually select or use the APIs. But I can go in and assign an, a, uh, an image and also a um, configuration file for that device that will be provisioned onto the network. If I look at how those APIs work, essentially there are the two um, ways of doing it. I've got config files, and we've just added templates as well. So there's some templating capability in the controller. Um, I have a library of images. I can create a project, which is really just a, almost like a directory name for, for rules so that you can group them together. And then I create a, a rule. Um, that ties the project, the image, and the um, serial number and MAC address together. So if I have a look at what one of those looks like in unplanned device, oh, sorry, projects, see here. Here's an example of a rule. It's uh, a device here. There's no certificate. That's an option. I can actually get it. Because the controller has a PKI server built into it, I can get it to allocate a certificate if I want. Um, I've got the MAC address, the product ID, and this is the configuration that's going to be downloaded to that device, or in fact was downloaded because the status is provisioned. If I look at this particular example, you can see here the status is pending. So whenever these um, devices are connected to the network, in this particular case, it's not actually going to match a rule because there's no serial number. This is an example where you would use an installer to basically span a, scan a barcode of a device. And it would, you would be able to, the installer app on the smartphone would give you these um, devices as options. And you could scan the barcode, and it would actually instantiate the rule and use the API to, to deploy the device just using a barcode scanner. Normally, what you would do is you'd uh, um, populate the, ser the serial number in here, but you don't have to. You can see an example of an unplanned device over here. Um, this device has contacted the controller. And I can either claim that device, ignore that device, or delete it. If I claim it, I need to select it. If I claim it, I get to choose the image, the config, and I can move it to a project if I want to. Now, the point is that everything I've shown you, from uploading files and, um, to the controller, to creating projects, to creating rules is all available programmatically via APIs. So if you go to the blog series, there's a whole bunch of blogs that I've put together around those APIs and how they work. Um, a little bit about the plug and play protocol. So essentially, the way that plug and play works is there's an agent inside the device. It discovers the controller via a bunch of different mechanisms, option 43, DNS, et cetera. It contacts the controller, then basically matches a rule. And then if it matches a rule, that image and the configuration is pushed down to the device. If that's successful, the device is added to the inventory of the controller, and it becomes provisioned. How many people have ways of generating their own uh, configurations? Some sort of templating mechanism. You can generate the configuration file, right? That's a common thing. The challenge that most people have is, how do I take that configuration file from my laptop and get it to the device when the device is connected to the network. So this um, blog series goes through the APIs that you would need to, to use um, to get that to happen. So again, um, there are some example APIs here. I talk about how you can automatically create those configuration files, how you can use those APIs to upload and um, create things on the controller. Uh, what we can do is if you, if you had downloaded um, that collection, and if you look at the section that says Network Plug and Play, there's a whole bunch of different worked examples I have here 
um, about how you use those APIs. So in terms of um, finding out all of the projects that exist on the controller, that's um, API slash v1 slash pnp dash project. And if I do a get of that, you'll see that there are these um, pre-provisioned sites. And that will match the controller. If I wanted to create a new site, that's going to be a post, right? Because a, a get will get me the contents or get me all of the projects that have been created. Uh, and a post is the way that I could create a new one. So in this particular example, I'm going to create a site called Sydney. Reminds me of home. What time is it? It's 9.36 PM. Um, and all I need to do is to press send. That task will be created, familiar with tasks. What do I need to do? I need to get the content of that task. Magic of Postman variables does all that in the background. And you can see here I get a message back saying, um, successfully created the new site with a site ID of this, which is something I'm going to need to, to store away. If I wanted to create a rule in that, in that um, project, apologies, you can't quite see this, but PMP project slash that 32 character string, because I need to identify the project, slash device. And then I give it the serial number, the platform ID, the host name, and I have a PKI equals true flag that says that I want to enable um, device certificate uh, on that device. So I press send. I get the task. And I successfully created that device rule. Now, just so that you, I'm sure there's some skeptics here. Any skeptics here that think that was smoke and mirrors? If I come across here, oh, there's a project called Sydney. And you can see that Sydney Switch 1 with this particular MAC address has been created. And so that rule is, uh, has been created. Now, the thing I didn't do is I didn't add a configuration file or an image file to that. That's just an extra parameter that I need to apply. So quite easy to do. Um, the other thing that's in that repository is uh, a bunch of examples of how you can use scripts to automate some of this. So if I go to PMP, um, in this particular set of examples, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use Jinja 2 templates to generate configuration files. I'm going to upload those configuration files to the controller. I'm going to create a project for the particular site. And I'm going to create the device rule that maps the MAC address, sorry, serial number, the config that I've created to that particular site. So it's a very simple script, about 15, 20 lines of Python. Um, it's called create and upload. Uh, essentially, all it's doing is, you know, oops, just finding projects, making sure they're not um, created, uploading files, creating rules, looking at the Jinja 2 templates, and doing all that automatically. So if I look at the work files inventory, that's just a CSV file. Um, all that does is has a list of the host name, the serial number, the platform ID, the site, IP address. Anyone use Jinja 2 templates? Yep, love them. If I look at... Oops. Templates. So I have a, a really sophisticated configuration file here. Um, I'm sure all of you will want to copy this and, and take it home with you. Um, not. It's really just to illustrate the point, right? Um, there are two variables here. You could have 100. I've just chosen two. Um, anything inside a curly brace is variable. So host name is a variable. IP address is a variable. Um, and most importantly, and this is a trap for young players, the last line needs to be end in your configuration file. How many people have been burnt by that? Everyone who does plug and play for the first time forgets the end, and you'll get an error message saying that it failed because there was no end found. Anyway, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run that script. 
Now, bear in mind this is an educational script. Bear in mind this script is going to give you a whole bunch of debug information about API calls that are being made. You wouldn't use this in the real world, but it's just an educational tool. What that script is going to do, as I said, it's going to create the files. It's going to create the rules. It's going to create the projects and upload everything to the controller. Now, there's one other thing that I've done to allow multiple people to run this. Site names, device names, and also configuration files are global. What happens if two people run this script and try and create the site called Sydney? Well, only one person would be able to do it. So this script actually has a little bit of magic in the background where it generates a dynamic four-digit pin and it appends that to anything that is um, global. So you notice that the, the config file actually has 6230 appended to it. You notice that that 6230 is appended to um, other things like the, the name of the site. So the site, instead of being um, Sydney, will actually be Sydney-6230. Uh, now, if you want to, I know some people won't necessarily believe me, but if I was to, and if you were to see that, you probably wouldn't believe me either. If I was to refresh this and have a look at the projects, you'll see that, oh, actually, I think I did that on a different controller. In fact, I'm very sure I did that on a different controller. Let me show you where I did do that. I was using, yeah, there's a reason that I used a different controller there because, OK. So this is going back to my lab in Sydney because there was something else that I wanted to show you that actually uses a, a later version of code. Come on. I need to make this bigger, don't I? So now if I look at projects on this particular controller, you'll see that this is actually where I created them. So you can see the 6230 and the Sydney 6230 if I look inside these, you'll see that the switch 02, you'll see that the config file that was created does, in fact, have those variables instantiated, so switch 2, and it's 10.10.10.102. Um, if I was to be a good corporate citizen and clean up after myself, you will notice that I clean up those sites. And if I was to do a refresh here, you'll notice that that goes away. So you see that the Sydney site's disappeared, the Melbourne site's going. Um, the other thing I have done is I've produced a slightly more industrial version of this um, and published that under, in Git as under PNP tools. So it has, if you go to Git and if you look up um, or you find my repositories, oops, um, there's something called PNP tools. I'm just about to put a blog together about this. Um, it's got something called PMP config templater. And essentially what that is is an industrialized version of what you just saw. Um, the templating is a little bit more powerful in that if I take a look at the source here and the way that the work files work, um, the templates are hierarchical. So I've got a base template, which is all of the basic stuff that I configure on a device. And then what I've done is I've used um, some of the cool aspects of Jinja to create some macros. And then I've got like a four switch stack. And it's dynamically generating configuration blocks based on whether it's a, an access interface, whether it's an AP that's connected, or it's an uplink trunk. So it's programmatically generating all of that, that configuration. 
and it just does a bit of a nicer job. It doesn't have the suffix, so it's, in, it's assuming you're the only one that's running it. Um, some other things that exist in that directory are what's something called PNP Watch, uh, and that's a way of watching or seeing what happens to all of the uh, the steps along the way in a plug and play process. So here's an example of me running it yesterday. Um, what it does is it shows me all of the steps that plug and play takes and how long they, they took to, to execute. Um, okay. Final thing I wanted to show you was one of the new things we've added in 1.4 is in device inventory which is the reason I was using that controller. In 1.4, which is just about to come out, um, we've added something that's pretty cool called Command Runner. And basically what that allows me to do is select a bunch of devices, and then I can apply a series of commands, just CLI commands, so show clock, for example. Um, I could do show IP in brief. and I press run, and what the controller will do is go and run those commands on all of those devices and give you the output. Now, as you might guess, I'm not terribly interested in the UI. I'm more interested in the API. Um, and you can see here the output of the, um, the commands. Um, one of the things that I've done is, and I'm working on, and again, I'm about to, one of my little challenges here, oops. One of my little challenges here is to turn this into a blog post as well. Um, there's a little script I've written called CLI Runner. Um, and there's a bunch of examples that I have around how you could use that to basically run a, a command on a device. Or the controller has this concept of tagging, where I can apply a tag to a device. And I can have multiple tags. So for example, I could tag all my switches. I could tag all my IOM devices. I could tag, create any number of tags. Uh, so what this little script does is it takes that tag, works out all of the network devices that have that tag, and then applies the commands to all of those network devices. So for example, if I wanted to do a show um, NTP status on all of my IWAN devices, I could do that. So what this is going to do is look for all of the devices that have the IWAN tag, it's then going to take this command, show NTP status includes sync, and it's going to give me the output. Now, there's a whole bunch of different use cases for this um, command runner tool. Um, that's a very simple one. This is going back to my lab in Sydney, so that's why it's taking a little while. Um, you can see some of the examples that I've got here. Um, one of them is there was a customer that I was working with had a PCI requirement where if a switch had not been transmitting data for seven days or more, they needed to identify that switch port and shut it down. So one way of doing that is if you do a show int and you execute this magic string, um, what you'll get is two lines back, which is the interface name and the admin status, as well as the last input and output time. And depending on the switch architecture, one or more of those will be never, but there'll be one of those that will be active. And if one of those has been active for more, or has been active for last active time was more than seven days ago, you can identify that switch port as being one that you need to shut down. So this is an example of how you could get all, those all, all the information about those switch ports in one easy um, go, and then it's quite easy to parse it with something like TextSFSM, and then generate the list of um, switch ports that are in policy violation. Um, one of the other things you can do is you can, only, you can do more than just show commands. So I can actually do a test cable diagnostics TDR. Um, anyone heard of the TDR capability that we have, time def domain reflectometer? Basically what it does is inside the switch port, there's some special uh, electronics that allows us to test the um, length of the cable and the um, reliability of the cable. So if there's a cable break or there's a faulty cable, we can identify that in band. Um, and it's a very powerful tool, except that not many people use it because it's too hard. So this makes it really easy to embed that TDR capability into some troubleshooting tool or some sort of script. Um, the reason I haven't published this yet is that I'm about to um, also add a template um, capability here so that you can have 
curly brackets interface. And then you can supply some arguments that say, on the switches, only do it on the interfaces that are physical, and only do it on the interfaces that are up or down. So you've got these options where the script can um, basically, because the controller knows the status of all the interfaces, can look whether the interface is physical or virtual, whether it's up or whether it's down, and then it will build out all of the commands that need to run um, to execute this. So look, look out for that in the next couple of days, depending on how busy I am here. But that's one of the things that I'm going to be publishing in the next few days. So I apologize we're out of time. But I really want to thank you for all of your attention. Um, hopefully, you found this useful. I'm really passionate about APIs, programmability, and, and the way that this is changing the way that we operate networks. And looking forward to spending some more time with you at Cisco Live. So have a great day.